We um, have been anticipating this uh, opportunity for quite a while. And uh, it's not uh, necessarily the best time to be on the, on the program at the very last session. Uh, and especially when we have two virtual reality, uh, virtual world society sessions at the same time. So we have another one that's going on in parallel with Kent Bai. And so we're competing with our own people. Uh, but we'll have fun anyway. And uh, we'll be a small, intimate crowd. And it might be great if you guys could come up a little bit closer so we could see a little better. Um, and um, because there's some amazing things that we're going to be able to tell you. We had some problems with our, some of our uh, files didn't get into the system, apparently. But we'll roll with the punches, right, guys? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So let me introduce our speakers. Let me start off with Ryan. Ryan here is to my left. You may uh, have seen Ryan last night. Ryland. Uh, Ryland, sorry. <laughs> Why don't I get Ryan? Apologies. Okay. Uh, Rylan um, is a 17-year-old high school junior who is an innovator, coder, designer, writer, filmmaker, explorer, and an extremely passionate tech enthusiast. He develops apps, websites, VR, AR software, and builds computers. Ryland composes all the music for his works, as well as creating the modeling, texture, and code. He also writes a high school insider, uh, in quotes, from, for the Los Angeles Times, including insightful and inspiring articles about technology. Ryland, um, he sees the value of XR, especially for education. I'm sure you write about that as well. Ryland's ed dedication and focus are a beacon to any youth who wants to create meaningful XR work. Now, last night, Ryland was awarded the Nextant Spirit Prize. Now, this is sort of like a, a, a Nobel Prize in XR. And uh, at 17 years old, uh, Ryland has received this. This honors individuals under 18 or under 19 who have made significant work that has inspired others and who have a great future potential in advancing virtual society goals through their work and example. So let me introduce Ryland. Mm. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now next is um, one of these uh, forces of nature, um, Marie Graham. Marie is uh, amazing. She's a uh, director of a high school VR, XR, uh, VR AR lab in Mount Vernon School in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Additionally, she's a teacher of humanities and innovation and an immersive technology evangelist who leads and learns from an amazing group of students and faculty at the Mount Vernon School. Paul, uh, partnering with Alienware, HTC Vive, and Oculus, her school, which is steeped in design thinking, has organized a VRAR lab where students create non-gaming content that positively impacts both local and international communities. Currently, her students are developing content for a pediatric rehab center and, and are designing an innovative uh, VR lab for an Indian village school in Movalia. Did I say that right? Movalia. Movalia, yeah. India and are partnering with a local historical museum to create interactive content for patrons. In her former life, now get this, in her <laughs> former life, she was a certified nurse midwife and a family nurse practitioner. How many babies did you deliver? About 1,200. 1,200 babies. Yeah. Okay, so she's sort of starting from the beginning, right? <laughs> Working with the kids. Uh, that's Marie. <laughs> Let's welcome Marie Graham. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to turn to Kathy, Kathy Bisbee. Kathy is a fellow at the MIT Open Documentary Lab. She's co-founder and director of the Public VR Lab in Brookline, Massachusetts, and CEO of its parent organization, the Brookline Interactive Group, BIG, BIG. The Public VR Lab is growing a network field for community XR that promotes accessibility, digital inclusion, and diversity. The lab is disrupting traditional media communications, um, digital media communications and community-based civic media 
journalism, and arts. Cultural and educational organizations by providing access to low-cost XR toolkits, equipment checkouts, extensive training for adults and youth, cohort filmmaking, production grants, uh, artist residencies, fellowships, and creating XR content in the public interest. Now, last night, also, Kathy was awarded the Nextant Legacy Prize. She said she didn't feel that she was old until uh, she received the <laughs> Legacy Prize. Okay. She did just have a birthday, though. So uh, Two weeks. In two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Um, and so she received the Legacy Prize, uh, which um, honors living inspirations who lead by example to show how we can each have a role in changing the world for better through XR. So let's welcome Kathy Bisbee. Good. Okay, let's go to the, the first introductory slides. And you see the four beautiful folks here. Oh, well, three of them at least. Uh, the last guy there. Uh, I'm, my name is Tom Furness, and uh, let me just give you a, a minute about me. I'm, I'm uh, this guy that's sort of been around a long time. I've, I started working on VR 53 years ago, and uh, for the first uh, half of my career for the Department of Defense, I was developing fighter cockpits that used the VR technology, flying into fighters, testing this stuff, and, and for those years, I basically was working on the foundational work that led to what we have today. And then in 1989, I left that, uh, uh, beat my sword into a plowshare and became an academic uh, professor at the University of Washington and started uh, uh, another two labs. I started a lab at the University of Washington, Human Interface Technology Lab in 1989, and we've been working on a number of technologies since that time. We uh, spun off 27 companies um, that are working on the technology. We, uh, two of those companies are traded on NASDAQ at a market cap of $12 billion. This was done with my, my students. And, uh, and um, started another lab in New Zealand, one in Australia. And um, generally are working in this field. Uh, uh, with some of my colleagues, we formed the Virtual World Society again in uh, 2014 with the idea that we want to inspire people to work on uh, um, humanitarian applications of the technology. So what uh, we're gonna do with this eclectic uh, bunch of folks, right, yeah. is, um, we're gonna have different perspectives of bridging, bridging what we're talking about, this education, educational ecosystem. And because we are coming at it from different, different angles. And we are supposedly called the epic educators. So here we go. And so from the youth standpoint, Ryland is going to speak to us. From the school standpoint, uh, we're going to have um, Marie speak to us. And then from the community or the people standpoint, um, then Kathy's going to speak to us. And I'm going to close up with from the home standpoint. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to you guys so you can uh, uh, take off and uh, go to work. So we're going to the next um, slide deck. Um, the number two slide deck. Have the, the, the clicker? Yeah, you have the clicker. You want to sit there and do it? Oh, I can go, yeah, sure. Or you want to stand up and do Let's it? Let's do this. Okay. Standing is more <laughs> active, it's more energized. That's it, that's it. That's right. right, okay. Is yeah. this one, this one, right? It is, uh, Great. Yeah, yeah, this is, I got it. yeah. Great. They are. There you All right. Go. Okay. That's the, the, the last slide. Can, can we go to the first slide, please? First slide, please. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. I am Ryland Daniels. I am a uh, VR, AR content creator, a uh, futurist, and also a 17-year-old. And I'm here to talk to you about, you know, how this all happened and why am I here? Well, um, I'll start with my uh, story. Uh, so I, I, I started with the journalism. And when I was a very young, um, I won a national competition to be a kid reporter for a Time magazine for kids. And uh, through this opportunity, I got to, uh, to, to, to have a, uh, I, I got to talk with, uh, with great tech visionaries, um, such as uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, the, the creator of Mario, um, and it's, it's, it's actually very interesting because uh, on that day, um, the day before, I actually ha had, had just broken my arm. And I was like, oh my god, I'm going to review video games. I mean, the, the, the creator of Mario, but I broke my arm. How am I going to try out the, the new video games? Um, 
So what happened is I still went anyway to, to, to an E3, which is where it was, and um, met Shigeru, and uh, he gave me the inspiration because uh, he, 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 he assigned my cast and said, you can do it, you can play these video games, you can make it, and that was amazing because it really gave me the inspiration and the confidence to kind of pursue this later on. Um, I also met Bobak Ferdossi, who is uh, the, uh, the, the NASA engineer. He, he's also known as the Mohawk guy. He worked on the uh, Curiosity rover. Uh, so I, I met uh, a lot of cool tech visionaries. Um, and through this time, also later on, I also, am, I, I also currently write about, about technology and VR, AR, and stuff like that for the Los Angeles Times, where I continue my, my, my journalism and reporting um, about all the great kind of inspiration and tech visionaries in the tech world. Um, and this is another slide of that, where I'm also trying out different experiences and learning from, from the community and also writing about it uh, for, for the world to see. Um, now, uh, through this kind of great collection of inspiration I've received over the years, I got so inspired to actually make a, a VR, AR experience for the first time. So this was uh, in the eighth grade, I'll say. Um, I made a AR trading card game. It's kind of akin to uh, what Pokemon Go is or what Magic the Gathering is, but it's through AR. So you have a physical augmented reality cards that I, I, I designed up there in a Photoshop, and um, then, th then this is how it works. So this is me presenting it. <laughs> yes, indeed. Technology can be vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly awesome. I mean, that is just the true message of what I'm trying to convey here, that, 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 that one can have so much great experiences with, with, with technology that, that technology is truly transformative in people's lives. Uh, so, indeed. Um, now, I also continue to make my, 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 my own game, so, but I'm also following the non-linear, uh, the choose-your-own-adventure format. So, this is a game... Uh, called, uh, called Linkable that won the Scholastic uh, Art and Writing Award. Um, and uh, basically, there, there are multiple endings uh, throughout the story, and uh, depending on the, the decisions that you make in the story, it actually changes the story. So um, I, I, I also scored this um, app, and so uh, depending on the decisions that the player makes from their own uh, emotions or instincts, both the story and also the soundtrack actually changes to reflect the, the changing emotions throughout the story. So it's kind of about going inside a, 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 a computer terminal and you make different decisions like that. Um, now, uh, I also created a Frankenstein AR200. So this is an, a, a, a multi-user um, AR scavenger hunt that celebrates uh, the, the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein novel. Um, now, um, it's very interesting because, um, uh, so this is how it works where you walk around your local environment and, um, and the different objects are geospatially mapped through the cloud on certain coordinates uh, throughout the world space. So it's kind of akin to how Pokemon Go works. And uh, through this, uh, you, the user through your phone or tablet have to walk around and collect the uh, different body parts. And uh, throughout this process, if you collect all the body parts, you actually build and recreate your own Frankenstein's monster. So this is actually a very uh, interesting blend of both technology and literature and storytelling as well. And, this, and, and, and also, it's, it's on the App Store, so I, I encourage you to get it, to get it today. Um, <laughs> And uh, this is how it works. Uh, so, so through the phone device, you can collect the objects and then build a Frankenstein. Um, now, I, I, I also was invited by, by Snapchat to make a uh, AR lens for them for, for the brand new developer tools, the, the Lens Studio. So uh, I, what I made is a Fly Me to the Moon. Which is, which is an interactive AR lens for the Snapchat app for your phone um, that is also, uh, that, uh, that, that when you open your mouth, 
a rocket shoots out and lands on your head. Uh, so that's why it's called Fly Me to the Moon, because it also makes you look like a moon. Now, uh, important to note that this is, uh, is based off of Malay's uh, the, the, the A Trip to the Moon, the famous uh, film. And it's kind of a, a celebration of that as well. So it's also a symbol of how technology can be combined with uh, great works of art as well to create to, to tell a compelling narrative. Um, now next up we have a colonized Mars. So this is a, a work in progress app and development for the Magic Leap One uh, that is also a multi-user experience where uh, players have to work together to build a colony on Mars and make it survive for as long as possible while, while, while taking into, into account the, the, the conditions of weather, of the food supply, of, of the various colonists' needs, and stuff like that in order to make the colony survive for as long as possible. Uh, so so it's, also, it's also taking into account like a future aspirations. Um, then I, I also made a star code. It's an AR escape room, and, um, and, and how it works is that uh, you as the user, oh, so first it, it scans the room around you, so actually for each room that you play a star code in, it will actually be different depending on the surfaces and the walls in the room. So it's, it's sort of mapped to the space around you, uh, the, 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 the shape, and you're basically inside a spaceship. And the, 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 the spaceship is crash landing towards Earth, and you have to escape in a limited amount of time. And it encourages teamwork and collaboration as you try to, to solve puzzles to escape from the escape room. Now, um, I, I, ha I had Unity uh, in this, as well as AR kit in the process of the development. Uh, now, there are actually some very interesting design challenges for this app, because I, 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 I actually, I, I was kind of, I, I was uh, trying to experiment with uh, combining uh, the various AR plugins, as well as Unity, and um, it's interesting, because certain plugins nowadays, they don't normally are intended to work with, with each other, so I, I was kind of j just trying to make it work together, and also to, to reach out to, to experts for help in the field. Um, and that is what we, uh, and that is what I resulted in doing. It's a star code escape room that is, pl that is played by multiple people at a time. Um, so there's some, it's a very interesting design process. And of course, I, I encourage people after the show to reach out to, to, to uh, invest in this so, 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 that, so that we can make an, an even bigger escape room. That's like the whole world. Now, um, I, I also started the uh, VR AR club at my high school. Um, and, and, and I also spearheaded the, that Star Code project with the uh, VR AR club members, uh, where there are various designers, various uh, coders, developers, storyboarders, animators. Um, and I, I also engage in, in, in a lot of outreach towards the uh, community through different schools, and I also mentor. So this was at a um, uh, MIT, where I mentored at, at, the, at their hackathon about arts and technology and VR. Um, now, I'll finally here show you um, this uh, app called um, Brain Runner. Or, uh, sorry, actually, before Brain Runner, I'll show you this.
so again, it's kind of a, a way to, to combine uh, the, the interactive and narrative storytelling as well as design and music and all these features to create a compelling narrative. Um, I'll also show you this. So, so, so this is called Brain Runner. It's a VR journey through the brain, the human brain. It's based off of real medical imagery of the hippocampus. So there are, there are different characters that, that you can interact with that, 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 that guide you through the story. And, and, and those are all different uh, functions of the brain. So, so while you're going on this adventure, uh, you actually are also at the same time learning about the different brain functions and how it works. So here you go into the, to the cerebrum. So I, I modeled all the graphics and also composed the, the, the score, which evolves depending on how you go throughout the story. And so the idea is that there is an AI chip in this futuristic brain, and it's been hacked by a rogue AI. So you, as the brain runner, you have to um, try to, to, to save the brain from this kind of almost AI brain virus that's occurring. Um, and this is kind of a journey where also, as you're about to see, you can also walk on the neurons. With, uh, so I also developed a, a, a walking locomotion system where you, you move your hands back and forth to move around the scene to give it a more immersive and realistic uh, experience as you journey through the brain. Um, uh, so, um, and and I, I also composed the, 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 the soundtrack for it. Um, Now, um, now, so, so I, 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 as you saw, I, I design so many things. I, I do world building, um, and I draw, I design, I do art through, through the various uh, 3D modeling. I make characters, um, and um, I, I also compose music. I, um, like there. <laughs> so I, I, I was a fellow at the, 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 the Los Angeles Philharmonic. I uh, compose uh, different, mu different types of music, but, but, but the music I compose, it's like a combination of, um, of a classical music, like a classical instruments, like piano, cello, flutes, and also a digitally synthesized and produced music. Um, and that is uh, part of the, of the soundtracks that are in each of the apps that update as you go through the story. Um, so I, I, also, I also want to talk about this idea and notion of the hybrid human. It's something that combines interactive storytelling, world building, art, design, and interactive music that updates throughout the story. I think this is exactly what we need for uh, VR, AR content, because uh, it makes it more immersive, it makes it more memorable for the user, and something to share that will have a real um, impact on the future. Um, and that, and as um, Helen Kay uh, said once, the best way to predict the future is to invent it, and that is exactly what I, I, I set out to do. So um, thank you so much. Ooh, okay. okay, Marie. Okay. Actually, you know, I don't need that. Yes. Well, my slides did not arrive, so I'm going to have to be incredibly interesting and just <laughs> have you look right here. Um, it was a regular October day in 2016. Um, I taught middle school at the time, and we had been studying refugees and immigrants. And I'm so hopeful. You know, I'm standing in front of the kids, and I'm like, 60 million people are displaced per year, 
and 30 million of those people are children. You know, they were thinking about what they were gonna wear for Halloween, they were thinking about lunch, they're 13, 14 year olds, and it's really hard sometimes to capture their attention. I went home and I felt like I just hadn't done a great job as an educator. I felt like I hadn't reached the students. And so what I did was I went home and I had a Google Cardboard headset and I watched The Displaced by, um, that's by New York Times. Has anyone ever seen that? It follows three refugees, one from Ukraine, one from South Sudan, and one from Syria. Well, I'm not gonna tell you about my reaction except to tell you that I cried. And the next day, I could not wait to get to school. Now, I'll be honest with you, I am a teacher who always can't wait to get to school. But this particular day, I walked in and each kid, I had put a Google headset on their desk with headphones. So they came in and I said, okay, it's a special day, take out your phones, opposite of what I normally say, right? Put your phones away. So they all take their phones out, they download this, and then I watch. Um, Tom Furness and I have both talked about the magic of watching someone be fully immersed for the first time. I stood there in the room and I watched 15, 13, 14 year olds do this. And then it was completely quiet. You know, not many people can say, when you look back on your life and you can see where things change, I can point to this moment, this exact moment, because as they took the headsets off and they put them on, the, on their desks, I saw a 14-year-old boy in tears in the corner, which if you've worked with 13 and 14-year-old boys, you'll say it's not a common thing. And I heard a very soft voice that came from the right, and this is what I heard. A child said, Miss Graham, they're, they're like us. I thought they'd be a little different. And that was the exact moment that I decided to change the trajectory of what I was doing. This technology is here, it's not leaving. I could see it building up and now I said, how can I harness this for good? Now, after that, I had to get equipment and I work for a school, so you know, not bundles and bundles of money coming my way. And what I did was I reached out to Alienware. I went on LinkedIn and the kids watched. And I reached out at the very top we got, a, we got a response within about 12 hours. Um, next thing you know, a week later, I'm on the phone with like the top echelon of Alienware. They're sending me call bridges. Now, I was a midwife and a teacher. A call bridge, I didn't know. I expected it, I figured out how to get on the conference call, and then they said, can you write a, write a white paper in three days? Now, my boss was on the phone call too, and I, I was like, sure. And we got off and he's like, Marie, have you ever written a white paper? And I said, no. And the next three days were just entranced. Now speeding forward, we have a lab, a high school lab that is content creation that is non-gaming. Um, our kids are on fire for virtual reality. But here's the thing, I have a school of design thinking. We are enmeshed in user design. So I said to the kids, let's start with questions. What do we need to do? Um, the first thing that happened was um, I got a call from a museum. They said, what can you do for us? So I went to this museum. As, I don't know how many of you are any Teddy Roosevelt fans in here. Well, Teddy Roosevelt's mother was born in Roswell, Georgia. There's a beautiful museum, but it's completely dead. I mean, it's full of antiques, period antiques, but there's nothing else going on. So we said, might we create something that when you stand at the bottom of the stairs and you have on a VR headset, Teddy Roosevelt walks down the stairs. The, the piano that is now, you know, just sitting there is now being played by someone. The kitchen is full of people cooking. The next thing that happened was I got a call from a philanthropist from India. His friend had heard me speak at Games for Change and he said, I build schools in India and I work with small children in a village called Muvalia. I am going to buy them 10 computers. Can you help create a VR lab for them? Well, I'll tell you, I always say yes to projects and figure it out later. So I said yes, and now our students are designing a VR lab in Muvalia, India for children who have never left their, um, their village. Um, now, then I thought, what, do we, what can we do to have an amazing, amazing project? Well, I start talking to the kids, and we landed on pediatric rehab. You see, two of the kids in, the pediatric, in, in our VR lab had undergone pretty painful rehabilitation. So we visited the hospital, we spoke to people, and we found out what students like. What do pediatric students like? 
Well, pediatric students and patri patients all like the same thing. They like colors, they like rhythmic music, they like motion, and we began to do research. We read 45, um, we read 45 articles from PubMed on VR distraction. And this is what I'll tell you we learned. The brain is the most powerful organ in the body. It's also the least well studied. It has 100 billion neurons and 10 to 100 trillion connections. Now, I wanna, I wanna take you through two scenarios. I'm working in an emergency room. A child comes in, he's six years old, and he has a compound fracture of his left tibia. He is screaming. He is highly uncooperative, if you can imagine. He is flailing around. And there is a decision that is made in that moment by the, doctors, by the doctors who are taking care of him, and that is to sedate him. Now, I wanna give you another scenario. You have a 10-year-old girl who's getting ready to get a shot at the pediatricians. You think a 10-year-old would be fine with injections, but of course, they absolutely are not. And she is crying, and she is upset, and a nurse comes in. She has a lollipop and a sticker, and she begins to tell her this crazy story about a bear and a forest, and it's lit on fire, and it's climbing the tree, and at some point, the little girl turns around and says, when are you going to give me the shot? And, and what do you think the, the nurse says? The shot's already been given. And it all comes down to this. Pain requires attention. Pain requires attention. And the brain does not multitask very well at all. So if you are able to hijack that, then you are able to make a humongous um, deficit in pain, up to 50% reduction in pain and 70 to 75% reduction in anxiety. That, to me, is magic. The students and I also studied about opioid use. We know that in 1999, 16,000 people died um, of narcotics, and we know that in 2017, over 70,000 people died. What we're seeing with immersive technology, or digiceuticals as we're calling it, is that we're able to reduce the amount of narcotics. The next thing we did was I put the kids in small groups. What is unique to a pediatric population? The kids came up with, well, the headset has to fit. It can't be too scary, it has to be age appropriate. Another group of kids, I said, well, what's unique to a hospital situation? We interviewed school, I mean, um, hospital administrators. We talked to OTs, PTs, child psychologists, and we came up with privacy, and it has to be very, very clean. And then the students began to design. They took all 45 articles. What can we learn? We polled children, and we came up with an island. They began to code. We created an island on one side. It incorporates everything that calms a child down. There's rhythmic motion, there are waves, there's seagulls, there's a turtle walking around. But you see, children also really love agency, the ability to play. So if a child is in a, in a situation where he or she can move a little bit, they can follow a, a path around an island until they get to the top, and they can look around until they find a beach carnival. They go down, they're in a beach carnival, they can play simple games, and they have more agency over what they're doing. Then, of course, there are teachers who say, well, what are they learning? <sighs> Collaboration, networking, solution seeking, creative thinking, ethical decision making, and those are the hallmarks of what we learn at our school. Um, and then I wanna say finally, what I've learned is this. Number one, get out of the way of students. I mean, a perfect example is right here, Ryland. If you get out of their way, kids should feel the swing of doors opening in front of you. That is our job. Um, two, let's use technology for good. You know what? There's a lot of violence in this world, a lot of violence. What can we, to con what, what, what can we do to contribute that isn't violent, I think is really good. Um, always say yes to projects and figure out how to do them later. Every time someone comes to me and says, hey, can you try this? Every time I say, uh-huh, we can do it. And then, you know, my husband, my boss, my friends are like, but do you know how to do it? And I'm always like, no, <laughs> but we'll figure it out. And every time we do. Um, and then finally, teaching kids to connect with people. The world is actually pretty small. If you read a book, contact the author. If you're interested in research, talk to the people who do research. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say, people who talk about this generation in a negative way don't know them. 
This new generation is kind and inclusive and warm and creative, and anything I can do to support them, I will. Um, I am on Twitter, it's just Marie Graham, um, and you also can go to mountvernonschool.org slash virtual reality, and I would love to partner with each and every one of you in some way to help move my students forward. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marie. All right. Kathy? Oh my goodness. Hello, everyone. I feel like we should be sitting in a circle instead of, <laughs> um, especially for my part of the uh, conversation. Um, we're, so I'm the, as, as Tom said, I'm the founder of the Public VR Lab. My husband, who's sitting here in the middle, um, co-created the, the initial organization. And because my organization was bigger in Boston, we took it on and for the last four years have been building a field for community-based XR and community-based VR and AR. So um, we offer, as part of Brookline Interactive Group, which is our parent organization, we're a public, traditional public access television station. How many of you have heard of public access TV or cable television? Some of you run stations, I know. But um, So we have been really reimagining what can cable television be, what can be the, you know, it's a little bit seen as the old Wayne's world model, um, but it's been such an important structure in local communities. We have 1,500 of us all over the country that have providing, been providing for 35 years traditional access to traditional media making, youth media programs, community-based journalism, hyper-local storytelling, and those community media centers, they know all of the local electeds, they know all of the librarians, they know all of the teachers, they know all of the students, and they're, they're a huge asset that we want to make sure that we can expand that mission of providing public access to media tools into the VRA or space. So that's what we've been doing for the last four years. So um, you can see our mission statement up there about the public VR lab. Our goal is to really open up the field, create a community-based movement and a field of community XR. So we can go to the next slide, or I can, I can do this myself, can I? Big button at the top. Awesome. So I'm a little bit of a Buddhist. Um, I don't know if you can be part Buddhist, but I think I am. Uh, wisdom is action arising out of a sense of presence. You hear this a lot in Buddhism, but it's something we know is true. When you sit with something, when you feel present with something, when you have a conversation with somebody that's really present, there's kind of a, an action that can arise out of that that is wisdom. And I think VR allows us to really tap into our individual and our collective wisdom and to take action on that understanding. Because when we're more present with ourselves, we act, we act in a more informed place, right? All of us. So um, that's sort of guided my life. You can see in these pictures, this is me working with um, a, I think in her 80s woman uh, at a local pop-up that we had recently. Uh, we have a project called Arrival that I'll talk about in a minute which is about immigration stories. She's from the Ukraine. Um, this was her first time trying VR. Uh, I do feel such an honor and a pr privilege to be sitting with people and be present with people when they have their first time and, um, and hear what actions arise out of that wisdom that they feel being present in VR. I'm also, um, my background is as a community organizer. Um, I like to watercolor. I'm not a particularly talented um, artist, but uh, I'm a visual artist. And then this is uh, me over on the right with a young woman who is an awesome environmentalist. She's six, she's in Nairobi, Kenya, and we met her when we uh, took one of our projects to the United Nations Environmental Assembly. She's planted 600 trees in the forest in Ni Nairobi, Kenya. So I'm a community organizer, a practitioner, and an immersive storyteller. So that's me. Some of you may have seen this, this video. Um, it's a bit dystopian, but I like to, talk about how we talk about VR for folks because we're onboarding so many people across the country and globally. I want them to get a sense of what the future might look like. This often, before we put them into a VR experience, gives them a sense of how it could be positive for public safety. You'll see in points of interest up there and then uh, you know, a warning that in AR that shows them that there's a car coming or, or an emergency vehicle. But we like to talk about it being a paradigm shift. This isn't just a new medium. It's very similar to, uh, for me, to 1999 where I was working at uh, Cruz.io, a local internet service provider in Santa Cruz, and I was trying to explain to people that you could buy pet food on the internet. 
and people just said, well, I can go to the store. I don't know why I would need to do that. That's where we're at now. We're having to do a lot of work just educating people, including philanthropists who do not understand what we're doing or the value proposition of it. But I really talk to them about it being a paradigm shift. And we have time to make it accessible to all. And that's the problem we solve. 30% um, of the US population will have VR devices by 2022. That might even be outdated and it might even be a lower number than that. So they'll still be unaffordable and inaccessible to the majority of the population. So we provide that access at the local level. And we have a train the trainers model that helps others be able to provide it in their communities. We don't want to be a vendor. We don't want to go to communities all over the world and stay there. We want to give you the tools and let you figure out how best to serve your community around media and technology tools. And that's VR. I think this is kind of interesting because a lot of times we have to get over this problem, which is a marketing problem for VR, which is it's just for gaming. So I was one of those people, I tried to Google Cardboard way back when, didn't like it, it was not that into games. And then in 2015, tried um, Clouds Over Cedra Gabo's uh, work with the UN, which was amazing, and took the headset off and had my, um, my uh, moment of metanoia of, of having a transformation, really, and seeing that it could be really useful for immersive storytelling. We need to focus on that much more than we do, on the community-based applications, so that it's relevant for local people who, aren't, who don't consider themselves techie. I hear that all the time. Oh, I don't want to try your really cute VR Yeti headset that we custom made. They say, I don't want to try it. Um, I'm not techie. I said, oh, no, no, no. Let me, let me show you. We have to show, not tell. Um, and that really is a great segue to our roots. And we are rooted in community media and really inspired by the work of George Stoney, who, um, who uh, passed away a few years ago in his 90s and was one, one of my inspirations for the work that he did as a community organizer at the intersection of media and, uh, and community activism. So we're based on and rooted in that legacy. And these are some of the programs that we offer. So we, we kind of feel like we're de de democratizing creativity. We do grassroots XR education, XR in the public interest, and we have a train the trainers model. These are some pictures from recent trainings this spring, actually. Um, the first one on the left is training uh, media makers on how they can transition into uh, emerging media. And then on the right, we have um, the MERS Tate Explorers in central Michigan who are doing uh, amazing work teaching girls about the possibilities that they could um, pursue in education, in travel, and in technology. So we also, this is the piece we did for the United Nations along with Datavise, who was our corporate partner on that. We created a three-dimensional globe and uh, put all of the particulate matter for air pollution onto each country, mapped it onto each country on the globe, 197 countries and political entities, and then we went to the UN uh, and showed global leaders, this is how you can use immersive storytelling in your community, for your nation, or even just to get your message across about the importance of climate change and other issues. We also had our VR Eco Hack in 2017, um, where we created content based on climate change education, and we had an awesome turnout, really diverse turnout for that. Um, and this is one of our tutorials up there on the left, we took a barbershop quartet uh, with help from some interns from Berkeley School of Music, and we created an ambisonic tutorial about how ambisonic sound works so that people can understand what that means to even have ambisonic sound in their content. So um, over on the right, it's just some of the things that, that we do and, and words that we use to describe our work. We have monthly dev jams slash hackathons. Uh, we had a Civic XR hack uh, just recently that was super fun. And then here's just a quick little video of some of our work. These are toolkits that we provide on a sliding scale to community organizations.
We teach seven different kinds of classes and 27 after school programs every year. This is the highlight of my career, right there. <laughs> next to the next in award, of course. So there's the globe in action that I was describing. Get some audio voice narration over that as well. So we did this at the beginning of January when people were feeling a little hopeless in our very liberal community in uh, Brookline. We used A-Frame, we worked with facility uh, to create this. And this is a monuments piece that we did. We're gonna now start 3D scanning some of those monuments as well. And submitting them to the Library of Congress so we have local public art and monuments uh, saved for future generations. We went to the Women's March uh, where we used traces.io to download and upload stories from the march all along the National Mall. So if you walk along the National Mall in DC, you can see those stories. And then this is our arrival project, which I'll talk about in just a minute. This is the National Ebola Lab that we did with the Boston Globe folks. <laughs> so I'm gonna skip through, because I know we're a little bit short on time here and tell you a little bit about um, the project that we piloted at Hub Week last year, the same video, the, the scenes from the video that you just saw were at Hub Week in Boston. So this is Arrival VR, and it's a collaborative participatory media installation that we've been building for the last year and a half. We have a pilot of it um, that you can take a look at, a prototype. Um, but we're curating the immigration and migration story of the United States of America from pre-1620 in a visual timeline to 2020 and our hope is to, to get into Sundance or Tribeca or a large film festival next year, early next year, but then take it across the country as an installation, as a both VR education tool, a community organizing tool. Um, so once you take off the headset, uh, you're also able to step out of it and in a mobile studio tell your own story about how your family arrived in the United States. So the idea is that you pick the date that your family arrived and it glows and it stays with you while you're seeing everybody else's story on that timeline. So it really implies this, your story is important, it's part of this story, you have skin in the game and so is everybody else's. Once you take the headset off, you can step into the mobile studio and then we're building curriculum and a guidebook for community-based organizations, museums, libraries, arts and cultural organizations for how do you roll this out in your community as a both storytelling project and also a VR education project and how do you have a community dialogue that could be potentially challenging, uh, but you can use this as a tool for that. And I'm not gonna show you the trailer because we're out of time, but you can check it out uh, online and this is the sort of the rollout for that. Uh, so that's the visual timeline and the civic events that are part of that and some of our partners on that project. This is what we ask community groups and if any of you are trying to bring VR to your community, these are questions that you could ask people that might inspire them to think about, oh, actually, I could, I could be using VR in my community. How could I be using XR? So these are some of the things. I'm letting folks take pictures here before I move to the next slide, which is pretty close to the end here. And a lot of times, I, I have a lot of examples for them, too, of how you can do that. And then uh, the last thing I just want to mention is we uh, just launched uh, our first ever VR AR scholarship fund, which will, we hope to raise at least 10,000 this year and give away uh, two or three scholarships. Marty Markison from PTC is actually in the room. He came to me about a year ago and said, well, I just got this bonus from my CEO for some work that I did for him. I wanna give it to the public VR lab. And I said, I'm not gonna let you off that easily. Let's build something together. And so we started a scholarship fund so we can seed it with that first $600 and then we can build it to 10,000 
hundreds of thousands, we hope, to help encourage, um, not that Ryland needs any encouragement at all, but, but there are a lot of people who do, and there are a lot of people who don't have access to the tools that he's had accessible, um, and we want to make sure that it's available and accessible to all, so that scholarship fund will help us do that. And please join us. There's the information about how you can sponsor us, um, join our community network. If you're doing a community-based project in uh, any community across the United States, please put yourself in our database. You'll, you'll appear on the map. And uh, we are having cohort calls and trying to encourage folks to collaborate and support each other because the more we can do, collaborate or die, right? The more we can do, um, the, the power of us working together will amplify our efforts in this space. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Aren't they awesome? <laughs> so I, I just, we just have a few minutes left, and uh, I'm just going to speak from the heart. Um, I'm still alive because of the passion that I see with the people <laughs> around me. Uh, I get to go in the classroom every day um, and interact with these very bright students and uh, try to pretend that I know what's going on and uh, wave my hands and things like that, but they are the ones that really are gonna make things happen. And they're so eager and enthusiastic and they're the best. And uh, the kids today are every bit as smart, every bit as energetic as they've ever been. But they have more power there. We have more power than we've ever had before. And there is abundance out there. All of these projects we've talked about and the ones that you're doing, you know, education is and will always be the major objective we're trying to get to here. Because what we're trying to do is lift humanity so that we can solve the pervasive problems of our age. And there are a lot of them out there. But we have the moxie to do it. And part of it is just getting started. I think a lot of people fear. Here, you feel like you're a small fish in a big pond. And uh, there's so many things going on. You go on the expo floor and you see all the different projects that are going on. You say, oh my goodness, how in the world do I have a part to play? Well, you just get started. And I believe the elements are out there, the planets are out there to align. All they're waiting for is for us to tell them what we want to do. And we have that power. And uh, those of you who are in the audience, it's clear that you have a feeling for this whole education thing. And um, uh, we've all seen, you know, there is no question anymore about the power of this technology, of immersive, immersive computing technology and how it uh, segues to artificial intelligence, whatever it's going to do. And there is no question about its power. We've tested it over and over again. Over the 30 years that I've been an academic, we've tested it. There is no question. We've spent millions of dollars of the, of the government's money. We know it works. The problem now is getting it in to a place where it can work, getting it into the schools, getting it into public places, giving uh, the Rylands of the world a chance to do the thing because it's there, isn't it? You have a passion. You have a fire in the belly. That's what you <laughs> want to get out there, right? That's like, yeah. Just wait till tomorrow, man, what this guy's going to do. So, so let... That's what the Virtual World Society is about. We are trying to enable these folks to get there. And we're not going to do it ourselves. What we want to do is be a catalyst and to provide resources so that can happen and to be an aggregator of uh, talent. And one of the new projects that uh, Eva, is Eva, Eva here? Is Eva still standing? Eva, uh, one of our, our communications people in the Virtual World Society is, is working on this community aggregation project. Another project I want to mention before we close, we have 59 seconds left. Well, one, what is it? We're counting up or we're, that's overtime. <laughs> Oops, it's going up. But I want to mention the Learning Living Room. This is a new project that we're just started. We're going to identify 100 families around the world that are going to become field laboratories for us to test and explore how VR can be used in the home. There's more technology in the home now than we're ever going to have in the schools. When you think about what we have in our own homes, in our living rooms and around the house, the kids have computers, all this. So, but right now, it's separating us. 
and it's not bringing us together. I believe that we can use it to bring us together, where families can go on expeditions together, where they can, can uh, connect with other families, where they can work on these pervasive problems together. So in this program, we're identifying 100 living rooms around the world, and we're going to watch what happens, because we don't know what's going to happen. We're going to seed it with, uh, with content uh, that have various attributes to it, including working with refugees and things like that. Uh, but we then want to document that. And we want to find out how we can tell the world that this is what can happen. In the end, what the Virtual World Society wants to do is have 10 million families who are involved in this. 10 million families who are willing to pay just $100 a year to have content delivered to them that can help educate the family. Lifelong learning in the home. When you multiply 10 million times $100 a year, how much do you have? Quite a bit. You have a billion dollars a year. So it's a lot of little fish. Not the big fish. We're not going to get the big fish to do it. It's a lot of little fish that can work together, and that's how we'll do transformation in the world. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, panelists, and thank for you. your wonderful contribution to the world and to this event today. And thank you for coming. <laughs>